welcome dr uh, uh, khairan tohi uh, uh, as today's speaker for our uh, microbiome seminar series um, and i would like to give just very brief introduction about about dr uh, tohi he completed his uh, masters from university of everdeen in uk and phd in university of surrey uh, in uk again uh, he completed his uh, post doctoral training with uh, in the university of reading with one of the very legendary father figure in the probiotics and prebiotics um, area so dr glen gibson who, who is known to be uh, one of the legendary in, in this area and uh, currently dr uh, tohoi um, is the chair of the department of food quality and nutrition at uh, fongion edmund match in italy and uh, he is the expert and very well known figure in uh my in diet microbiome interactions in gut health and the human health and uh without taking much uh much time uh today um i again welcome uh, dr tohoi and uh, uh to welcome to uh, share his wonderful research and uh, floor is yours uh, dr tohoi okay thank you very much harry okay so i just got the slides up Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, very good. So, um, as Harim said, my name is Kieran Chui. I'm a, a microbiologist working in the field of human nutrition. And my speciality is looking at how diets and different dietary components impact on the gut microbiota, both in terms of microbiome structure and function, but also in the metabolites they, they release into the intestine and then are absorbed into uh, the human circulation. Uh, and for me, this communication along chemical lines, short chain fatty acids, bile acids, and small phenolic acids, is probably one of the main communication channels between the microbiome and host, and certainly one of the most influenced by dietary factors, and especially dietary factors that we know impact on human health like fibers and polyphenols and probiotics. So just a little bit about my, um, my host institution. I'm, I'm in Fondazione Edmund Mac. It's a, it's a small agricultural and food research institute in the province of Trento in the Alps and Dolomites in Italy. Uh, traditionally, we've uh, had a, a strength in plant genomics, but more recently we've expanded that into the gut microbiome, into human nutrition, uh, into environment, climate change, uh, and, and other, uh, other related activities to the, to the local production stream, which is mainly fruit, apples, berries, but also cheeses. So typical mountain foods in, in Italy. So today I'd like to talk about some of the research we're doing and, and how different foods and different food compounds impact on microbiome and how they might influence human health. So this, oh, Hold on. This slide is just a, a summary of the gut microbiome. It describes how the, the microbiome, microbiota, changes in geography along the, gastroint the gastrointestinal tract from mouth to anus in terms of numbers of microorganisms, cell densities, species diversity. Um, and it's fairly true to say that the majority of the gut microbiome resides in the colon, in the large bowel, at the end of the intestinal tract. Uh, and so what really influences the gut microbiome in general uh, are compounds that escape digestion in the stomach and small intestine. So things like dietary fibers and polyphenols. These are very complex chemical structures where our biology find really difficult to break down, but the microbiota uh, have evolved to cope with this, uh, this, this, um, uh, these compounds as a source of energy, a uh, source of carbon, uh, and break them down into smaller compounds that can be uh, absorbed from the intestine and have a physiological effect around the human body. So looking at this in a bit more detail, um, here's the uh, gut microbiome with, with uh, human cells. You see mixtures of microorganisms. You can imagine dietary fiber resistant starch, 90% at least, maybe 95% of dietary polyphenols. So the, the, chemical, the, 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 the chemicals that put color and flavor into fruit and vegetables escape digestion in the stomach and small intestine and then help shape 
the relative abundance of different bacteria in the, in the, in the large intestine. Of course, the balance or relative abundance of bacteria in the intestine then shapes the flow of metabolites uh, across the gut wall into the circulation. And this is especially true for small phenolic acids. So the microbiota break down these com uh, complex plant polyphenols into small phenolic acids that are then more readily absorbed. Often these are also more biologically active, containing many of the bioactive uh, activities associated with plant polyphenols. Um, the, this transformation or the importance of this transformation has really only come to light in the last 10 or 15 years. And much of nutrition up until, up until then has really focused on these complex chemi chemical structures as, the, as they occur in the plant food. Uh, and so there's been endless amount of in vitro culture of human cells where we put these um, polyphenols on the cells, look at gene expression of what they might do in the human body. But the truth is that our biology, our cells, don't really even see these molecules. They see the microbial metabolites, the breakdown compounds. Uh, and it's only recently that we started to study these in terms of their physiological role. We know some play important roles in epigenetic processes. They regulate inflammation. They have anti-cancer properties. So many of the health effects associated with eating uh, high amounts of fruit and vegetables can be put down to some of these small phenolic acids. Of course, fruit and vegetables and whole grain cereals also contain dietary fiber. And these are complex carbohydrates that are not broken down in the stomach and small intestine by human uh, enzymes, and so reach the colon where they can be fermented into short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate by the gut microbiota in, in fermentation, where they, where they derive energy. Of course, these molecules then have uh, physiological roles both in the intestine, regulating intestinal permeability, for example, regulating production of mucin, regulating uh, production of incretins that impact on food intake uh, and energy harvesting. Um, they also regulate immune function both in the intestine and systemically, regulating the differentiation of dendritic cells or maturation of uh, Tregs uh, or the Th1 to Th2 transformation. So short chain fatty acids uh, are very important, both in the gut and systemically. More recently, we know acetate is an important um, short chain fatty acid and role to play in, in anti-obesity mechanisms related to thermogenesis and adipose tissue, for example. And butyrate has an important epigenetic processes as a, as a HDAC inhibitor, regulating uh, gene expression, especially around uh, cancer susceptibility uh, uh, processes. We also know the gut microbiota can produce uh, neurotransmitters, gamma aminobutyric acid, um, uh, serotonin from tryptophan. And these are released both in the intestine and in circulation or can interact along the gut brain axis through the vagus nerve. We also know that the gut microbiota produce various gases, including hydrogen sulfide and nitric oxide. And both of these have been shown to play an important role in vascular function. Uh, although uh, the balance, especially of, of hydrogen sulfide in the intestine, will also have uh, potentially harmful effects uh, related to ulcerative colitis and, and Crohn's disease. So in general, one of the main communication channels between the microbiome and the host is a chemical communication through these molecules, through short-chain fatty acids, bile acids, and, uh, and neurotransmitters. And one of the reasons I came to Fundazione Mac is along with the genomics platform, they had a very well-developed metabolomics platform specialized in looking at these uh, plant polyphenols, especially in wine, but also in fruit. And so they had all the methodologies for studying these small phenolic acids. So it was the ideal place to try and combine the metagenomics and the metabolomics you really need to understand how diet shapes the good microbiome. So over the past number of decades, I suppose, uh, three main um, dietary strategies have been developed to uh, uh, harness this diet microbe interaction to try and improve host health. Uh, the first uh, is a kind of a, an offshoot of, of the dietary fiber approach uh, is prebiotics. And this was developed largely by Professor Gibson and the University of Reading, where I did my, my postdoctoral training. And prebiotics are defined as selectively fermented uh, ingredients 
that results in specific changes in the composition and or activity of the gastrointestinal microbiota, thus conferring benefits upon host health. So there are things like inulin oligofructose, fructooligosaccharides, galactooligosaccharides, and these uh, sugars are, are not broken down in the stomach or small intestine. Human enzymes are, are not very efficient at breaking them down. They're fermented by the microbiota, and that fermentation results in a shift in the relative abundance of different bacterial uh, species, production of short-chain fatty acids and other compounds, uh, and these then impact on, on host health, both in the gut and systemically. Polyphenols, uh, we've known for a long time that fruit and vegetables are healthy for us, but in an effort to track down what bioactives in the fruit and vegetables mediate the biological activities, people have focused on polyphenols, and as I said, 90 to 95% of these escape digestion in the stomach and small intestine. And it's not until they're broken down by the microbiota that they become really visible to the human, to human cells and are absorbed across the gut, uh, gut wall into the circulation. And so a lot of recent work has been focusing on, on what these microbial metabolites of polyphenols might do in terms of, of host physiology. And finally, the next class, global class of dietary strategies for modulating microbiome or microbiome health effects are probiotics. And this is where you might apply um, a live microorganism in a food to uh, uh, impact on, on, on host health. Generally, there are things like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria that have the tradition uh, of use in fermented foods, especially fermented dairy products, bifidobacterium, is a, is a genus uh, associated with breastfeeding in infants. So breastfed infants have a microbiota dominated by bifidobacteria. And it's one of the reasons why we think this class of organisms are beneficial. Uh, so in my group, we've been studying how these, mainly these three different uh, uh, dietary strategies can be harnessed to shape the microbiome, shape the metabolites released by the microbiome, and then influence host, uh, host physiology. So, so for the rest of the talk, I'll give you some examples of the work we've been doing. Um, so in Fondazione Mac, we, we've set up this uh, in vitro system. This is an in vitro model of the, of the, of the gastrointestinal tract of the colon. Uh, this setup is, is a batch culture fermentation, pH controlled, operated under anaerobic conditions. And it tries to mimic how the microbiome uh, survives under short periods of time and changes in response to individual substrates. So we can put in different food products and see how uh, they are fermented, how they shape the microbiome, and what metabolites are produced. This is an example of an experiment we did together with, um, with the, the, uh, uh, the University of Brussels, looking at how different wheat fractions, uh, total wheat bran, ultrafine wheat bran, soluble wheat bran, or alurone, which is uh, a, a milling fraction of wheat bran that contains many of the oligosaccharides, minerals, vitamins, and polyphenols associated with wheat bran. So it makes these compounds much more um, available compared to native wheat bran because of the milling, the milling process. So we digested them using an in vitro digestion model and then put them into our colonic model to see how they'd impact on microbiota community structure. And we could see that all the wheat bran fractions seem to stimulate the beneficial bacteria, what we think of as beneficial bacteria like the bifidobacteria, roseburia, which is a big butyrate producer, uh, and doria within the microbiome. Uh, whereas this, uh, the more refined fractions or soluble fractions uh, were able to inhibit some of the organisms we think of as, as uh, more harmful, like the biophilus species uh, associated with, with, uh, with, with bile, uh, bile diseases, uh, e. coli and parabacteria deities, which is then associated with obesity. Uh, for this approach, we use a combination of both sequencing 16S, um, uh, RNA, uh, 16S gene, uh, uh, RNA gene sequencing uh, and DNA probes, which allowed us to enumerate specific bacteria within the intestinal tract. So we're able to use both relative abundance and actual abundance of, of the bacteria within the microbiota. Carrying on from that, we then conducted a human dietary intervention with the alurone fraction, where we had added uh, 27 grams of alurone uh, to breakfast cereal, to bread and biscuits, and gave this dose daily to overweight individuals for four weeks, looking at different physiological parameters relating to metabolic disease risk, 
We're also looking at uh, microbiome to see if we could see a prebiotic type modulation of the microbiota. So an increase in beneficial bacteria like the bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. Uh, and also looked at metabolites, uh, uh, metabolites in, in blood and urine. Looking really for biomarkers of intake or a metabolism of these polyphenols associated with the, with the aluron and wheat. Uh, we found uh, very modest or no significant changes in the clinical parameters associated with the uh, with the four week intervention. It was probably too short, and the population was probably a bit broad in terms of age. We had people ranging from 18 to 65 year olds, so we had healthy obese and uh, unhealthy obese and maybe a stricter population selection would have allowed us to uh, see some of the trends we saw in the clinical par parameters turn into statistically significant changes with the with the uh, Algeron intervention. But with the microbiota, we did see changes in microbiota. We saw a significant increase in bifidobacteria abundance, both with the fluorescent situ hybridization and, and qPCR and differences between the Algeron treatment and the control after intervention uh, with the sequencing. Uh, and the, uh, quite a similar effect was seen with lactobacillus. So two of the main groups we think of as beneficial responding to the aluron uh, intervention. In terms of microbial metabolites, we, we found many of the um, small phenolic acids that have been identified as putative biomarkers of intake for the, uh, for the whole grain cereals in general, such as uh, aminophenol sulfate, uh, the, the fruitic acid and fruitic acid derivatives, uh, as well as more general uh, metabolites of, of uh, plant polyphenols. In separate work, and we're now putting these uh, purified uh, microbiome metabolites of polyphenols on human cells, uh, looking at co-culture between CAPO2 and uh, PBMC from, from healthy donors as a model of uh, the good associated lymphatic system to see how these uh, molecules impact on, on immune function. Now, our region in Italy is famous for apple production. We produce about 7% uh, of the European uh, apple harvest every year. So apples are very important. Every roundabout on the road system has a little apple orchard. So every square kilometer is covered with apples, if not apples and, and strawberries and other small fruit. So it's, it's quite big business. So we, we've been doing a lot of work on apples. And one interesting experiment was, was carried out by, by my uh, by the previous head of the department, Fulvia Mativi, collaborating with people in INRAN, which is the, um, the nutrition center in Rome, the National Nutrition Center. And he wanted to see, could you look at biomarkers of intake for uh, up cloudy apple juice? So this is an apple juice that, that is naturally very high in polyphenols. But also what would happen if you fortified this cloudy apple uh, apple juice with, with a, a, a huge dose of extra polyphenols, 750 milligrams uh, per serving of apple juice. So we had a, an already high apple juice, high polyphenol apple juice, and then an extra polyphenol apple juice, and an acute setting. So we fed people uh, the apple juice and then measured their blood and urine over 24 hours, uh, separated by, by two weeks, so we could see the effect of both juices. We looked at how uh, these uh, how metabolites appeared in, in blood and urine, and could we relate these to uh, microbial metabolism? So this is some of the data. They used uh, an untargeted metabolomics approach to look at as many of the small phenolic acids as possible in urine and plasma. In urine, they sampled over uh, five hour, over twenty four hours. Uh, in plasma, over five hours, and you could see some. Uh, very different patterns in, in uh, the nutrikinetics, if you like, of the different phenolic acids. So things are absorbed fairly rapidly uh, in their native state as they're found in the plant. You can see them appearing in plasma within about an hour. So the dihydrocalcones are absorbed directly in the stomach uh, after ingestion of, of apples. They also include fluorothin, which is a marker of, of apple intake. And you can see them peaking after an hour and then slowly over five hours, rapidly over five hours, being cleared from the blood and something very similar in the urine. Now, just in stark contrast to metabolites that are the, the, the result of microbial metabolism. So if you look at the valerolactones, which derive from anthocyanin, prontocyanin metabolism, 
or apuric acids, which are basically the end product of nearly all polyphenol metabolism. You can see that even after 24 hours in urine, we haven't seen peak production or occurrence of the metabolite uh, in, in, in the urine. Uh, in blood, uh, also after five hours in blood, you're still only seeing the, the, the emergence uh, of these metabolites in the blood and don't see the, uh, the peak production. So this has major consequences for the way we carry out dietary interventions. Because if you extend the sampling of um, the postprandial uh, effect of the nutrikinetics, the kinetics of the metabolites, normally we collect uh, fasting samples and in dietary interventions. So we feed people apples for eight weeks, for example, and we collect blood and urine uh, the morning after the, the intervention at, uh, in a fasted state. So of course, none of these metabolites will be left in the blood, they'll be cleared. And indeed, even some of these slow metabolite ones, uh, they peak at about 10 hours and then between 10 and 18 hours overnight, these will slowly disappear from blood. So this is a, a major consequence for the way we conduct dietary interventions in trying to measure how microbiome responds in terms of metabolites. We should be conducting combined uh, postprandial studies with chronic studies so we capture some of these kinetic, uh, uh, kinetic patterns or models of metabolite uh, production uh, in blood and urine uh, as a result of dietary intervention. And there's still very few of these types of studies uh, in the literature. We also carry correlated production of these metabolites with the good microbiome present in the individuals. And we saw some significant uh, correlations, but also probably more important, we saw very nice patterns in the data between different pathways of metabolite, uh, um, related metabolites being broken down by very similar profiles of bacteria, showing that there's particular niches or collection of microorganisms which in the microbiota have this function of breaking down different, uh, dif different uh, and mediating different metabolic pathways of polyphenol metabolism. However, they might not be related to phylogeny. And this is another problem uh, so this is uh, this was urine, which is a very nice summary of metabolism. So this is data from the plasma, uh, and we can see, as well as more, uh, patterns of microorganisms associated with with, uh, with the, the major pathways of metabolite production, we can see some very strange patterns in the bacteria that are very phylogenetically distantly related, like the Anastipsis, which is in the Bacteroidetes and bifidobacterium, which is an actinia bacteria, showing identical patterns, correlation patterns with the metabolites. So basically they're behaving uh, in very similar manners within the microbiota, mediating the same physiological effects within the microbiome, but they're distantly very, phylogenetically distantly, very, 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 very far apart. So this really, um, highlights another problem with dietary interventions looking at microbiota in that if we rely solely on bacterial taxonomy, we might uh, get ourselves in knots with different organisms mediating the same physiological function in the host, even though they're distantly related. So the names of the microorganisms might not link up to what they're doing in the intestine. And that's a big, uh, uh, big problem with, with metagenomics, or at least 16S taxonomy going forward. It's overcome a little when we go to shotgun sequencing and look at pathways, because then you're looking at individual uh, metabolic pathways rather than uh, the, the phylogeny uh, or the taxonomy of the, of the organisms involved. Continuing with the apples, we moved on to uh, a chronic dietary intervention where we wanted to see could apples impact on markers of metabolic disease risk. So we looked at people that are hypercholesteremic, slightly high cholesterol levels, and looked at whether uh, a local apple, very high in polyphenols, could reduce cholesterol and impact on factors related to the gut microbiome. So uh, we intervened with a crossover design whereby we fed people either um, for eight weeks with two apples a day or a low polyphenol, low fiber, apple flavored uh, drink uh, for eight weeks. They crossed over from one treatment to the other and half the people had the apple uh, in the first experimental period. We took blood, urine, and feces before and after the interventions and had a four-week washout. 
Uh, and from the data, we didn't see any evidence of a, of a carryover effect between the treatments. What we did see was a significant impact on markers of metabolic disease risk and lowering in cholesterol. We can see that the first bar uh, is that the entire population, so all subjects, we see significant reduction in cholesterol, in LDL cholesterol, in triglycerides, and ICAM, which is a marker of arteriosclerosis and adhesion molecule. In females, this effect seemed to be even stronger than in men, uh, with also insulin showing a, a fasting insulin showing a reduction, and another adhesion molecule uh, related to arteriosclerosis, VCAM, being also reduced after apple intake in the females. In the men, we saw weaker response, uh, not, not significant in, in, in the men, and we had little over half the population were men. We did see differences in bile acids and plasma bile acids between men and women, with, with men having a significant uh, lowering in the oxycholic acid compared to, compared to uh, the women and the overall population. And when we did mathematical modeling, linear regression modeling, we found that bile acids could explain uh, levels of uh, starting levels of cholesterol and change in cholesterol with liticolic acid being associated with high cholesterol levels and um, uh, glucose deoxycholic acid. So a tertiary bile acid uh, from related, uh, an alternative product uh, of, to, to uh, liticolic acid by the microbiome being uh, associated with a lowering of cholesterol and apple intake. So it appeared that, at least in part, the apple intake could be explained by changes in bile acid signaling related to the gut microbiome. So moving on to probiotics. Probiotics is a different approach. It's, it's uh, providing a live microorganism in food uh, to try and impact on gut health through microbiome, but also through interaction with host physiology. And over the years, th th there's a different weight of evidence depending on uh, the choice of strain. Um, but a, a couple of important factors to remember is that in the small intestine, we have a population of microorganisms, mainly facultative anaerobes like the lactobacilli and streptococci and lower numbers of bifidobacteria, around 10 to the power of seven colony forming units per gram of contents. So it's, it's, it, it's a, a low density. A microbiome uh, community. If we then introduce a probiotic strain, and typically probiotics have about 10 to the power of nine, so 100 times more per dose, uh, at least in the fermented uh, dairy products or, or in some, some capsules. So the biology of the microbiome in the small intestine becomes basically the biology of the probiotic because it outnumbers the autochthonous community within the, micro within the small intestine. And so if probiotics have an effect, it's probably not in the colon where you have numbers of 10 to the power of 11 of autochthonous or, or host commensal microorganisms, but in the small intestine where it's passing through and daily intake will mean that uh, the biology of the small intestine, the microbiology of the small intestine becomes dominated by the probiotic being ingested every day. So there's a, a really nice example of, of this process uh, uh, a study a number of years ago by uh, the group of Freddy Troost in Holland, and he looked at three different strains of Lactobacillus plantarum and how they might uh, shape the microbiology and the physiological response in the small intestine. So he, he, he fed these probiotics to, to human volunteers and then used an advanced uh, endoscopy uh, process to sample the gut wall of the small intestine and look at gene expression in response to the different probiotic strains. And he, what he saw was, was change in gene expression in genes involved in cell adhesion or tight junctions between the intestinal cells in uh, inflammatory parameters. Uh, and these were strain specific. And this raises another very important point. Not only did the biology of the small intestine become dominated by the probiotic strain, but these uh, strains were different one to the other. And one of the major problems with the probiotic area is that the literature is dominated by meta-analysis on probiotics as a class of compounds. So they're treated like a class of drugs, like anti-steroids or, or anti, uh, antibiotics. Uh, and we look at um, the, the uh, 
the biological effect of these probiotics in different studies, even though different probiotics have different effects, same as different antibiotics have different effects. Uh, and so it's quite unfair to class them in a single meta-analysis. We need to class uh, probiotics as individual biological agents separately and then perform uh, meta-analysis to see whether they work or not. Uh, and this work, really, we don't have enough dietary interventions with individual strains yet to, to look at whether they work at, at, an, at, at a population level or, or within uh, human populations. Just to say in animal models, uh, probiotics, prebiotics, polyphenols uh, nearly all work all the time. So there's a huge amount of in vitro and preclinical data showing that these uh, biological entities do have physio physiological uh, impact on, on mammalian processes related to inflammation and metabolic disease risk and good brain access. When we translate that into humans, the data is much more uh, cloudy. We, sometimes we see an effect, sometimes we don't. There's these meta-analysis that group them all together to try and, uh, and say whether there's a, a population-based effect and really they haven't been conducted in a proper manner because each of these strains are different biological entities. Uh, some of the work that we've done, this is mainly preclinical data, so of course it worked, uh, was we, we looked at some of local dairy lactobacilli. One strain in particular was lactobacillus brevis. It produces very high amounts of lactobacillus, uh, gamma butyric acid. And gamma butyric acid is an interesting neuroactive compound derived from, from uh, glutamate uh, metabolism uh, by bacteria. It's naturally present in some of our traditional cheeses that use a spontaneous fermentation to make these hard cheeses that are typical of the Alps. But gamma, GABA also has the ability to impact on metabolic processes and inflammatory processes related to type 2 diabetes and also impact on the good brain axis and act on uh, things like stress response in animals. So we isolated this strain that produces about 10 times more GABA than other lactobacilli. And in collaboration with Catherine Stanton and Ted Dynan in, in University College Court, we carried out a, a mouse study where we fed our strain in, in purple compared to another lactobacillus brevis strain isolated from a, from a breastfed infant in Cork uh, and compared these in a high fat, uh, high fat feeding environment. So a diet that induces metabolic disease and obesity compared to a lean uh, fed, uh, fed control animal and looked at markers of metabolic disease and good microbiota and impact of uh, stress response in these, in these laboratory animals. So what we could see was with both probiotics, we didn't change body weight, we didn't change um, uh, the, the obesity as such. So here you, you can see that the high fat fed animals in red, the uh, cork pro, uh, lactobacillus brevis strain in green, uh, our lactobacillus brevis strain from the local cheese in, 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 uh, in purple, both of which produce GABA and the lean animals in blue. So body weight change over the, the eight-week dietary intervention didn't change. We saw obesity where we should see obesity. Uh, we saw differences in fat partitioning, however, between the probiotic uh, fed animals and the high fat fed animals with a trend towards, uh, in, in all three fat deposits uh, in the body, epididymal, subcutaneous, and mesenteric fat, uh, all being reduced in, in the probiotics. This becoming significant uh, in the probiotic fed, uh, fed animals. Uh, percentage body fat also slightly reduced in the uh, in the probiotic fat animals, uh, but in general it was this change in mesenteric fat that was significant, and that's important because visceral fat is associated with inflammation and taught to trigger some of the metabolic disease associated with with obesity. In terms of microbiome, we did see a change in uh, microbiota factors um, uh, in composition of gut microbiota. So just check the time, okay. Um, with the high fed animals being different to the lean fed animals, uh, but also the probiotic strain separating from the high fat fed animals. And we can see that some of the microbiota parameters, anastipsis, uh, bacteroidetes, and odori bacteria were associated with the probiotic interventions, whereas parabacteroidetes was associated with the high fat fed animals and many of the metabolic disease parameters pulling the, uh, being associated with the high fat fed animals, whereas bifidobacteria in particular 
uh, was associated with the lean fed animals. In terms of insulin uh, uh, resistance, we could see that the GABA fed animals had, had uh, lower glycemia, lower insulinemia, and this was particularly true of the uh, Trento strain, which was isolated from the local cheese. Uh, we could see that both strains produced high amount of GABA in the small intestine, becoming uh, uh, become statistically significant for the, for the Italian strain, the cheese strain, but also uh, in adipose tissue, higher amounts of, of GABA being produced. And in terms of stress response in the animals to immobility in a forced swim, swim test, at the number of fecal pellets, which is a marker of stress, the more fecal pellets, the more stressed the animal uh, in, the, in the large intestine, in the, in the rectum. So they were lower in the, in the uh, Trento cheese strain. And also in the cor uh, 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 cor cortisone, which is a marker, marker of stress, both in uh, fasting and in response to the, uh, to the forced swim st 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 stress uh, was lower in the, uh, the, the stress response was better in the, in the probiotic fed animals. So going on to the last couple of slides uh, and, and keeping on this, this uh, probiotic uh, line, individual probiotic traits, including individual gene functions, appear to be able to impact on host physiology. So this is uh, data from Susan Joyce, a collaborator from University College Cork, where she took different bile salt hydrolase genes from lactobacilli and cloned them into E. coli to see if the different presence or absence of different bile salt hydrolase genes can, can impact on gene expression profiles in the ileum and the liver of a germ-free animal. So here you have data from the germ-free animal on the extreme left, uh, the E. coli control, the E. coli cloned with two different bile salt hydrolase from different lactobacilli, and then the conventional animals. So you can see differences in gene expression. I don't expect you to go through all the genes, but just, just look at the color changes. You can see immediately that the presence or absence of the bile salt hydrolase can impact significantly in gene expression profiles, both in the ileum and the liver systemically uh, in, uh, in these animals, showing that a single gene from a probiotic strain, one involved in metabolism of bile acids or, or the, 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 the uh, gatekeeper gene in bile acid metabolism by the gut microbiota can impact significantly on host physiology. Uh, now we know that foods, polyphenols, fibers and probiotics can change the profile of bacteria, but also can interact with bile acids directly by binding them in the small intestine and driving them in the into the colon or into the feces, thereby stimulating bile acid metabolism or changing the prof profile of bile acids, uh, returning in the intrahepatic circulation. We also know that different bile acid species, primary bile acids or secondary bile acids, or tertiary bile acids like ursidioxicolic acid or secondary like liticolic acid, have different physiological functions, different cell signaling potentials, different potentials to uh, impact with uh, PPAR, uh, PPAR alpha, with FXR, with TGR5, an important uh, regulator of immune function, uh, with FXR in the liver, which, leg, re which regulates cholesterol metabolism, but also bile acid metabolism. Uh, and we know these, these, um, uh, these um, nuclear receptors are involved in uh, regulation of GLP-1 and insulin and glucose metabolism in uh, muscle contraction in thermogenesis uh, and in energy metabolism so and in inflammation. So many of the factors we know regulate metabolic disease risk. So collaborating with Cork and the University of Reading, uh, Judy Lovegrove, uh, and Ben Geary University in the Negev in Israel and the University of Insubria in, in Varese and near Milan in Italy, We've recently completed a, a project called Kabbalah Diet and Health, where we wanted to identify circulating of bile acids as a biomarker of health regulated by diet and changed by the microbiome. So we did this using three different uh, existing studies. One was the ROCAB study in Varese, which is a population-based study looking at uh, different uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, in the local population, in about a thousand, uh, thousand people, local people, we selected a thousand of these 
and then looked at bile acids and correlated that with different markers of metabolic disease, establishing by circulating bile acids as a marker of, of metabolic disease risk or cardiovascular disease. We carried out a, a mechanistic study in Reading where we intervened with apples, a probiotic, whole grain oats, or cornflakes as a, as, a, as a control for eight weeks in a chronic setting, and then conducted a postprandial challenge with a high fat meal before and after uh, the, the chronic intervention. And there we saw that all three bioactive compounds, the, the, the apple, the oats, and the probiotics, were able to shape physiological response in the postprandial setting, uh, explaining some of the, the observed or known health benefits of these foods. I won't show you all the data associated with that. We're still analyzing it. Now, at Cork, we're looking at different cell signaling processes related to bile acid profiles and developing new models. But I will talk about in more detail the study carried out by Ben Guerin University called the Direct Plus Dietary Intervention, Polyphenols Unprocessed uh, Study. Here they conducted a long term, a six month dietary intervention with three different uh, treatments to lower body weight. The first was physical exercise combined with advice for, for uh, a good healthy dietary guidelines. The physical exercise plus a Mediterranean diet where we were given walnuts to boost the polyphenol up to Mediterranean standards, about uh, 440 milligrams per day of polyphenols. Or a green med, uh, med diet uh, plus physical exercise where they intervened in poly, with polyphenol rich foods, including green tea, walnuts, but also uh, a new plant to Europe. Uh, it's, it's basically um, um, a duckweed, which is used traditionally in places like, Tha uh, like Thailand uh, and cultivated as a substitute for, for egg, basically, because it's very high in protein, but it's also very high in polyphenols and vitamin B12. And they use this to boost the polyphenols of this dietary group up to uh, 1,320 milligrams of polyphenols per day. They intervened for six months with this diet and then had a follow-up follow of 12 months. So it was an 18-month uh, overall dietary, dietary uh, uh, study. We looked at the gut microbiome and bile acids and polyphenols. Ben Guerin University did a lot of work on the metabolic parameters and fat partitioning uh, in all the usual suspects related to metabolic disease risk, but also cognitive function. And we're now analyzing some of the data with, with, the, with the papers coming out. One of the first studies for the overall dietary intervention looked at how the uh, uh, healthy dietary guidelines compared to the Mediterranean diet or the green Mediterranean diet impacted on intrahepatic fat. Uh, they had about uh, 90 people per group at the end of the study, and they could see a significant reduction in, in body weight, but also in intrahepatic fat uh, in all three uh, dietary interventions with the healthy dietary guidelines with the med diet, but especially with the green med diet after the six month dietary intervention. And interestingly, after with the, the 18 month follow-up, you could see that the green med diet were able to keep uh, the, the intrahepatic fat off. And this is an, an important marker uh, for NASH and, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease risk and metabolic disease in general. Here are some nice uh, MRI images of people on the Mediterranean diet on the green Mediterranean diet at baseline, and then after the 18 month, six month intervention and 12 month follow up. And you can see really the improvement in, in the fat partitioning. Like light, the light color is the fat, the fatty liver is associated with metabolic disease risk. They also found that the microbiome was related to, uh, or correlated with the degree of, of uh, fatty liver disease. When you change the microbiome, you could also correlate, it was correlated with the change in fatty liver, and this was strongest in the Mediterranean diet. You could correlate individual species, nine uh, of the bacteria with full shotgun sequencing uh, at the baseline with enteropathic fat. And as the enteropathic fat changed, so too did the uh, change in these bacteria over the course of the intervention. Uh, and also they, they were associated with an increase uh, with, with the, the green med diet, especially changes in ruminococcus, an important um, starch degrading organism. Importantly, this change in intrahepatic fat was also correlated with total phenolic acids in the blood uh, and correlated very nicely with the, with the green med intake with two metabolites, in particular 2,5-dihydroxybenzoic acid, 
which is a metabolite of salicylic acid, a plant hormone, or norangelin, which is a, a, a microbial metabolite of norangin, and one of the uh, most common uh, polyphenols in, in citrus fruit, for example, but, but broadly present across uh, whole plant foods. As part of this direct, stu uh, direct plus study, they also carried out uh, a very innovative, innovative intervention uh, in a subgroup of the population where they took the fecal microbiome at the nether of weight loss after six months, encapsulated it, and then fed it back to the people in a type of autochthonous fecal microbiome transplant. And these people then ate their own lean type microbiome for 14 weeks. At, uh, and uh, they then looked at different uh, markers of metabolic disease risk and how the, mar how the microbiota responded. In summary, what they could see is that when they received their microbiome uh, for 14 weeks after the dietary intervention with the green med diet, so with the nether of um, weight loss, they were able to retain the weight loss to a much greater degree than people who were given a placebo. And this is important because one of the main problems with dietary, with dietary approaches to treat obesity is that it doesn't work. It doesn't work in the, the majority of people. It works in about 15% of people in the long term. So more than 85% of individuals on a lifestyle intervention will put the weight back on after about a year. And more than that, they put on extra weight. It's called the rebound. They actually become heavier and more obese than they were before they actually dieted. So this programming of the body, of the response to, to uh, the obese phenotype is one of the major challenges in treating obesity. And in this study, they were able to, to, to show by, by maintaining the microbiome in the weight loss profile after six months, with the autochthonous fecal microbiome transplant, they were able to slow this weight regain uh, and slow the rebound effect in obesity. So when they looked at the microbiome of the people who received the uh, autochthonous fecal microbiome transplant compared to the placebo, and then compared that to the six month, the starting point uh, of, of the fecal microbiome transplant, you could see that uh, the, the, the AFMT group were able to retain a profile much more similar to that uh, uh, experience at the nether of weight loss after the six months of dietary intervention. And this effect was strongest where they were given the uh, green med diets compared to the med diet alone or the, um, uh, the healthy dietary guidelines. So it really pinpoints the microbiome as the key parameter uh, responsible for dietary, uh, for, for reducing the, uh, the, the weight, improving metabolic health and slowing the regain of weight uh, after the dietary intervention uh, in this experimental model. So just to summarize, um, our microbiome plays a very important role in host physiology, communicating with host physiology through things like short-chain fatty acids, bile acids, and small phenolic acids. Of course, there is the direct immune response through toll-like receptors, etc. But the metabolites are the, 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 the chemical signals that regulate how the immune function responds to the stimuli they receive from the external environment. So the functioning of immune cells, the functioning of adipocytes, the functioning of liver cells is greatly determined by the flux of short-chain fatty acids, bile acids, and small phenolic acids coming from the intestine. And these things are shaped by diet and microbiome interactions. So basically, your microbiome uh, is one of the engines that drive your metabolism and immune function, and that engine runs on the food that we put into it. Uh, and so diet microbiome interactions are, are critical, I believe, for, for looking at uh, host physiology and some of these chronic disease risks. So thank you very much, Harry, for inviting me to, to speak to you today. It's, it's a real shame my cousin visits, um, visits uh, southern, southern Florida. I'd love to sometime and see your new lab. Congratulations. Uh, and thank you for the audience for, for your patience uh, and my collaborators, of course. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Tohoi. Uh, yeah, now I think so. we are open for the questions. Great. 
So, um, and I can start. Uh, I have a few uh, questions. It's very fascinating work, and and thanks uh, for uh, for giving your time and sharing the your your wonderful research here. So, the one question I have is, I think so. You are doing the different di dietary interventions, and in these dietary interventions, one of the major problem remains is the compliance of the patients, whether mm -hmm. they are they are really uh, taking the intervent like intervening diet or, uh, and all. So is there any way, any markers like these metabolites, you could have uh, uh, optimized them where you can track them based on if somebody is eating them or somebody is not eating them? Yep, that's that's really the work of my colleague here, Ursula Vorsek and, and Fulvio Mativi in the metabolomics platform. They're very interested in biomarkers of intake. So these are compounds that are specific to an individual food. So recently they found biomarkers of intake for banana, for whole grain cereals, for particular fruit, for Coca-Cola. So there are individual molecules for individual foods that allow you to then um, have some confidence about food diaries or food um, dietary uh, records that people uh, either recall or re record in, in diaries. Because of, of course, um, people, aren't very faithful in recording food intake. Um, they often don't see what they're eating. And this becomes more exaggerated with the obese because that's part of the disease. They don't see the calorie intake. They don't see the snacking. They don't eat, they don't, they don't see um, the, the, you know, the, the, some of the, the snack foods are, are the, the, um, the, the, the soft drinks especially as part of their diet and might not record it. So they could be eating or drinking two liters of, of, of Coca-Cola at the same time as recording your foods, but not recording the intake of the Coke uh, or coffee with a whole pile of sugar in it as well. So it's important to have these biomarkers of intake. Um, my own view is that these biomarkers of intake are very important for improving dietary assessment, but they may not be biomarkers of health and the biomarkers of health may be the common compounds shared between classes of food, not the individual ones that mark out an individual food. So, for example, biomarkers of health might be short-chain fatty acids that are common to all dietary fibers, or this, the end products like ruleic acid or some of the benzoic acids that are shared with all polyphenol metabolites. And that would make sense from an evolutionary point of view, where you know people are we're not koalas that are that are um, evolved to eat uh, uh, eucalyptus or panda that eat bamboo. We are omnivores that consume a wide range of plants. So we're exposed to a wide range of fibers and polyphenols. So it makes sense if the common compounds are those that have a physiological effect in humans. Thanks. Okay. Following up on that, that question, uh, this is the way it's just asked, so I think you were a very interesting presentation, but can you um, elaborate more on how you conducted your own studies and the compliance of your patients? Because you mentioned with the at uh, autologous transplants and, and the effectiveness and how the dietary interventions don't last. But yep. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how much of that is due to lack of compliance? They get weary mm -hmm. of, yep. of following the protocol and then go back to their old ways. Yeah. So looking at the data, they recorded data on, uh, these are just the fecal micro, the capsules, fecal microbiome uh, transplant. They had tolerance, they have intestinal bloating, that all side effects, et cetera, measured uh, between those on the placebo and those on the uh, fecal microbiome transplant. Uh, there was no difference. So uh, really we believe that the patients didn't know whether they were on placebo or the active treatment. These were large capsules covered in, in glycerol. I imagine they didn't chew them. <laughs> they just swallowed them quickly. <laughs> so uh, compliance in, that, in this trial probably wasn't, wasn't an issue. Um, also, this study conducted by my collaborators in, in Israel it was, was conducted in a, in a military camp. And compliance in military, military camps is a bit greater than in free living community. So um, it was a it was an isolated community setting. So uh, compliance was a lot easier to monitor uh, and record over the intervention period. Uh, in our own studies in in Trento, uh, we relied on on spot urine tests. 
uh, or urine before and after treatment. If we're looking at markers of bio, bio intake for, app, for the apples and the aleron study, then we could see the usual suspects in terms of metabolites in urine, indicating that at least uh, in the period immediately before ingestion, uh, collecting of the samples, the people are eating the test foods. But after that, it's dietary diaries, you know, and, and there is a degree of uh, error in, in self-reporting. I see. Great. Just, just kind of one, uh, if you may allow, um, one more question with, from the this same study. You have this is a crossover and um, kind of randomized uh, trial, and the, there was a four-week uh, washout period. Was that like uh, confirmed that the effect of the previous arm was washed out in four weeks? Yeah, but we, we looked at, we tested for carryover effect and didn't see anything in terms of polyphenols or the physiological response. We saw some slight carryover in the microbiome, but it, it wasn't strong, wasn't statistically significant. So we could, we could say that the four week intervention was sufficient and not to impact on the study measures. That's, that's that's very interesting. And if I understand correctly, the FMT was given from the same individuals to the same individual, right? Yes, so it was their own, their own two. Okay. Which is, uh, you know, uh, which is an important point as well. It, it reduces the risk, uh, but it also is a tailored intervention. So because we, we kind of used a prebiotic approach to change the profile of bacteria and then fed that, that their own microbiome back, we hope to see a, a, a stronger personalized response, which I think we did in, in the, overall, the overall intervention. Is there a way to, 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 to monitor from their, um, from the urine or, or feces, the, whether the, compliant with, for instance, the, the amount of sugar intake or fat intake? I mean, it, it, um, just as you are looking at from a positive standpoint, if they're yeah. eating the right foods, monitoring yeah. whether they're eating the bad foods. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's more difficult to, obviously, sh sugar is, uh, is difficult because it's glucose mm -hmm. uh, in the blood. So, um, it, it's difficult to phrase that. that. There are methods, but you have to, there are not methods that can be applied to a population based study. So you could use a stable isotope uh, labeling of your sugar intake. So, but in a, in a population based study at the moment, there's very little way to look at compliance in terms of uh, unhealthy foods. They are developing markers for specific foods. So, for example, I mentioned Coca-Cola, and, and my colleague Fulvia Mativi has developed a, a marker of Coca-Cola intake. So, it might not be the, the the sugar you're monitoring, but some other ingredients in the food that has a signal you can pick up using metabolomics. But these biomarkers are are, are only coming up now. This is cutting edge and uh, nutrition and um, nutrition metabolomics uh, uh, work. So, they're only being developed now. In terms of applying to population-based studies or, or even small dietary interventions, it's still quite a long way off. I see. For for individual foods. Yeah. Do we have any more questions in the chat? Uh, I don't see them. And this is this is really very fascinating work, and uh, thanks, uh, Karen. And I would like to share the uh, my story, like how I connected with uh, Karen um, back in when I was doing PhD in India, uh, and uh, uh, Karen and his team was working on really uh, a very cutting edge science uh, even before this whole microbiome uh, thing was like a, a big thing. Uh, so I contacted uh, uh, to him um, regarding to one of the fellowship program, uh, the Commonwealth Fe Fellowship Program from India. And that's how uh, we were kind of connected there. But then we disconnected uh, back in there. And recently, we connected back in one of the study section in Canada for reviewing the some grants. And that's how I see him. And and it's really glad to kind of reconnect and uh, and 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 see see you here. 
and yes uh, you are welcome to uh, uh, come to the south florida sometime and once i think so this world becomes normal and then you will kind of yes. uh, <laughs> arrange our visit to uh, meet individually you know, thanks a lot again um, thanks very much Haryam. and best of luck in your new position thank you thank you a lot Okay. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining today's uh, talk. And uh, thanks again, Dr. Tohui, for, uh, for giving a wonderful talk. And uh, yeah, uh, have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you.